Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today for these weekly Saving Life on Earth webinars. We've enjoyed this chance to let staff talk about the issues that they're passionate about and to introduce you to the staff who are working on the issues that you care so much about. The coronavirus pandemic has really pulled back the curtain on the grim realities of meat production in this country. And so today we're going to talk about that and how that overlaps with the extinction crisis and the climate catastrophe and environmental health and justice issues. So we're very happy that you chose to spend your time with us today. A couple of technical notes, we've disabled the chat bar because we heard from you guys that that could be really distracting. We're going to say 15 to 20 minutes at the end for questions and answers. These are issues that people are very passionate about. We've already gotten a bunch of questions emailed in. Um, and we try not to send you too many emails, but last week, instead of a follow up email to the webinar, we sent out an action alert without the link to the video and people were upset. So we heard you and tomorrow everyone on the webinar will get an email that has a link to the video and instructions on how to join Slack, which is our activist channel. And tomorrow from noon to one Pacific, Stephanie Feldstein, who you'll meet in a minute, and I will be on Slack to answer any questions that we don't get to today. And also that email you'll get tomorrow will have a link to an action alert. So you can take action on the issues we're gonna talk about. And with that, I'm gonna let our speakers introduce themselves. Hey everybody, my name is Hannah Connor. I am an attorney in the Environmental Health Program. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you tonight. I am physically located in St. Petersburg, Florida. Hi everyone, my name is Lori Ann Bird and I am the Environmental Health Program Director and a senior attorney here at the center. Oh, and I'm um, here in sunny Tucson, Arizona. Hey everyone, um, I'm Stephanie and I am located outside of Portland, Oregon. Hey Stephanie, your audio cut out. Will you introduce yourself again? Sure, I'm Stephanie Feldstein and I'm the Population and Sustainability Director at the Center and I'm located outside of Portland, Oregon. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and I hope your audio doesn't cut out again. But Stephanie, let's just start with you. Um, why is meat production relevant to the extinction crisis? Meat production and dairy production as well are really among the most devastating industries on the planet. Just about every threat that you can think of to wildlife, they're one of the leading drivers. 30% of the Earth's surface goes toward raising livestock and feed crops for those animals to eat. It's, you know, so if we're looking to save half of Earth, like 30% is a big chunk that's just going toward this one industry. 16.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions, that, um, that comes from livestock production. It uses an enormous amount of water. If you just look at the drought-stricken Western United States, those states, one third of the water there is used just for irrigating crops to feed cattle. So just one piece of this industry is using a massive amount that's, that's changing ecosystems out west. Um, all the billions of animals that are raised for food create an enormous amount of manure, um, and that manure creates all kinds of, of uh, pollution, air pollution and water pollution. It's a major threat to aquatic species. And we also see a lot of direct threats to wildlife as well from this industry. Millions of wild animals are killed every year to protect livestock. Animals including wolves, bears, and coyotes that are seen as threats to livestock. And even animals like prairie dogs, their burrows are seen as being hazards for grazing cattle and, and they're killed by the tens of thousands. And as this industry continues to grow, it's growing into sort of the remaining wild areas that we have on Earth. It's growing into some of the remaining hotspots um, that makes it a major threat to biodiversity. Like if you think about last year, those the devastating fires that happened in the Amazon rainforest, most of those were set to clear land for pasture or for feed crops. And while there are some better and worse ways to raise livestock, the reality is that right now there are too many people eating too much meat for really any system to, to not be a threat to wildlife at, at the current amount that we're eating. Thanks, Stephanie. So what's the connection between meat production and COVID-19? Well, all of that habitat loss that I was talking about, it increases pressure, it puts wildlife and people in closer contact 
which means that people are being exposed to, you know, to, to pathogens that we otherwise wouldn't be. It puts us closer to these animals where zoonotic diseases can jump from one, to, from one species to another, um, you know, in cases like COVID-19 from bats or pangolins to, to people. But we, there's also a connection in general between pandemics and, and industrial meat and dairy production because we've seen previous pandemics coming from, from factory farms. And there's you know, a lot of experts predict that we will see more future pandemics coming as well because of these unsanitary conditions uh, where these animals are raised. But also, you know, as you said in the introduction, with COVID-19 specifically, we've also, it's really pulled back the curtain on the meat industry. And, you know, we've seen the tragedy of workers getting sick in these really unsafe and exploitative conditions in factory farms and meat packing plants and slaughterhouses. And, you know, we're being told that there's a meat shortage, which is really up for debate because there's a lot of meat that's still being exported. And the reality is that we don't really have a meat crisis here to be worried about. What we should really worry about is this industry that's putting profits ahead of, of human welfare, animal welfare, biodiversity, and environmental health. It's a lot. <laughs> um, Lorianne, how does animal agriculture relate to plant agriculture? And does animal agriculture affect bees and butterflies and pollinators? <laughs> uh, that's a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> Well, so, you know, typically when people are driving through the cornfields of the Midwest, they think all this, this is food for feeding people. But the truth is 36% of the crops grown on earth are grown to feed animals, 36% um, and, and a bit more in the United States. Um, and so a vast amount of the acreage that we're using for agriculture is actually going directly into the mouths of farmed animals. Um, farmed animals are not particularly uh, efficient <laughs> at turning all this food into food in terms of meat. And so um, there's a huge amount of waste kind of along that chain. Corn is the primary feed grown um, for animals in the United States. Uh, it's about 90% of the corn grown in the United States is for animal feed. And corn grown for animal feed is grown using the worst practices in agriculture. Um, corn is a very needy crop, um, so it requires a lot of fertilizers. Um, the nitrogen from corn is, of course, famous for helping to create the large dead zone in the Gulf. Um, it's also almost always, unless certified organic, it's genetically engineered. Um, so almost all conventional corn is genetically engineered, and it's genetically engineered to be tolerant to pesticides. So a lot of times people think it, you know, it might be genetically engineered, be drought resistant or higher yield, but it's engineered specifically to be able to withstand a dose of a pesticide, almost always glyphosate or Roundup that would normally be fatal if it was sprayed on the crop. Um, so it takes a huge amount of um, pesticides and not only glyphosate or the uh, pesticides it, it's genetically engineered for, but also other pesticides. Pesticides like atrazine um, is very heavily used on corn. It's the second most popular pesticide in the US. Um, it's also an endocrine disruptor, um, perhaps more fam most famous for um, turning boy frogs into girl frogs. And most corn seeds are treated with neonicotinoids, which are um, one of the leading which are, which are the pesticides that play the leading role in pollinator declines. Um, so each and every seed is treated with a neonicotinoid seed coating, um, and then it goes in the ground. If a songbird is unlikely to eat it, just one might be enough to kill a songbird. So these, these vast monocultures create these vast biodiversity dead zones. Um, then to get to your question about bees, obviously this does not create great <laughs> habitat for bees or butterflies. Um, but in addition to just directly poisoning them when they're unlikely enough to be around when there's a very high toxic dose of pesticides being sprayed or having just been sprayed, these pesticides kill all the wildflowers and other life that made the edges of fields inhabitable for wildlife um, for so long. So take monarch butterflies, for example. Monarch butterflies are everyone's favorite butterfly, but we all know they're in bad trouble. And the reason why is not because the pesticides are getting sprayed directly on them, although it's 
definitely not good for monarch butterflies to have pesticides sprayed directly on them. But glyphosate, which is used very heavily on um, GE corn, is um, especially good at killing the one plant that monarch butterflies need to live, milkweed. And so when monarch butterflies travel from Mexico to Canada and then back again, they need to be coming upon steady, reliable, good patches of milkweed on their way back and forth. Um, but now, because so much of our agricultural land is devoted to these industrial monocultures that have such a high pesticide load, there's not a lot of milkweed for them and monarchs are in a 90% decline. Um, and then there's the native bees. Um, so EPA will look at the impacts of pesticides to honeybees. But honeybees are a non-native um, species that is raised in order to provide services in agriculture. There are 4,337 species of native bees in North America, and EPA doesn't even hardly consider how any of these pesticides that are used across hundreds of millions of acres are affecting them at all. That is bleak, because a lot of us really <laughs> love butterflies and bees, but to make this webinar even bleaker, we're gonna transition over to Hannah, who does some of the bleakest work at the center Hannah, were slaughterhouses an existing problem for environmental health and worker safety, or is this unique to the coronavirus and we're just now seeing it? Yeah, I'm afraid it's about to get more bleak, everybody. Um, but I'll try to keep it as uplifting as possible because we have a lot going on that's actually moving forward and moving the ball to make it not happen again. So, yes, um, COVID-19 is unfortunately only opening a window for the public to see into a politically powerful, just fundamentally flawed system of production um, that would not exist in its current form without externalizing many of its costs and taking advantage of workers, as has been discussed in communities and animals in the environment. And just kind of to give a little bit of a background of what that pollution looks like, because very often slaughterhouses aren't considered for their pollution. You talk about factory farms, um, you talk about you know, row cropping, but slaughterhouses aren't as much. So one of the ways, um, and relevantly to our conversation, that they externalize their costs are by polluting the environment, and in particular the water and air that species need to survive. Um, slaughterhouses as an industrial category are the largest discharger of nitrogen in the country. Um, that is according to the EPA from 2015. They're also one of the largest dischargers of phosphate, uh, phosphorus, sorry, in the country. Again, according to EPA in 2015, um, much like the nutrients that Lorianne was talking about, those are the things that go into the Gulf of Mexico and they cause dead zones. Uh, they're the things that go into waterways and they call out, cause algae blooms. Those algae blooms could lead to mass kills of fishes in particular. Um, but also all sorts of different problems within those waterways when hypoxia six sets in and there isn't the oxygen necessary for those species in there to be able to survive. Um, and then in addition to those nutrient pollution streams, um, they also create wastewater, and I'm sorry if everybody can hear my dog in the background. Um, wastewater from slaughterhouses also contains salts, uh, fecal bacteria, pathogens, veterinary pharmaceuticals, uh, including antibiotics in particular, um, chemicals from cleaning plants, blood, fat, urine, I mean, the things that you'd expect from a slaughtering facility to have. And then these wastes are often dumped, sometimes in treated form, usually in some type of treated form into waterways, um, sometimes lawfully, sometimes unlawfully, as we will discuss in a second. Um, and according to a 2018 study from an organization called the Environmental Integrity Project, who we work with quite a bit, discharges from 96 of the largest slaughterhouses were found to have at least a third of them violating their wastewater permits for their Clean Water Act limitations uh, for bacteria. So that includes pathogens like fecal coli, fecal coliform, E. coli, and terracosi. Um, and, uh, you know, another example is just that in 2015, and this is one that's really vivid, but one that has stuck with people quite a bit, a wastewater lagoon failed at a JBS slaughterhouse in Beardstown, Illinois, releasing millions of gallons of untreated wastewater and leading to a 64,000 fish fish kill. Um, 
So we're talking about really, really nasty pollution streams and at the center recognizing the larger environmental and species implications related to this contamination in 2019, well before, and really in 2018, well before coronavirus became a word of our shared lexicon, the center initiated a series of cases that seek to directly address the significant environmental harms and injustices caused by the slaughter industry. Um, and I'm gonna run few, through a few of these and I'll try to get, keep myself from getting too wonky uh, and I'll try to keep myself from using acronyms, but um, somebody buzz me if I don't succeed in that goal. Um, so the first is a Clean Water Act enforcement case and we're gonna start small. So start with individual enforcement and we'll build to kind of some of the national efforts that we have going on. Um, it's a Clean Water Act enforcement case against a slaughter operation that you may recognize by name uh, because of its shuttering for 11 days due to significant worker health issues and safety problems that they experience around COVID uh, and that lost its eighth worker, I-10, earlier this week uh, to the disease, the JBS beef slaughter operation in Greeley, Colorado. So the facts of that case, um, which were brought with us with Public Justice and Food and Water Watch, are that the facility had chronically for five years failed to comply with the whole effluent testing limitations or wet testing limitations in their Clean Water Act discharge permit. Um, and that was according to reports from the facilities themselves. Now, especially relevant to the center's work, what that means is that wet testing limits are testing limits designed to ensure that effluent being discharged from facilities into waterways is not unacceptably, to unacceptably toxic to aquatic life. Um, and so they were violating that. And since that may sound like a bunch of scientific mumbo jumbo, that means the root of this matter is that the facility was not able to neutralize a bunch of salty wastewater that was created through their processing. And this shows you an additional way that wastewater is created here. They're processing of cow hides, uh, the cow hides that were generated on site after slaughter. And that salty wastewater ended up in Colorado streams and Colorado rivers um, and was unacceptably toxic to aquatic life. Um, and so for us, that case was filed almost a year ago today. Uh, our anniversary of filing is Saturday, I believe, uh, and is ongoing. And then second, with a nice kind of parallel to that individual enforcement case, we also, again, recognizing the huge pollution outpour from this industry, uh, looked at the effluent limitation guidelines, so the guidelines that are established in Clean Water Act permits for slaughter operations, to see if they were up to date, to see if they had standards in there that were protective of water quality. And they didn't. Um, they're able to sig continue significantly polluting our waterway because the treatment and discharge standards are weak and they're out of date. And so we also are addressing that. Um, along with, you know, a handful of diverse groups, um, which I'll talk about actually in a second, because I, I think it's really important to consider what the different interests are here. We sued the EPA for failing, and this is the Trump EPA, for failing to update these effluent limitation guidelines and standards. And kind of to conceptualize it, right, the idea is an effluent limitation guideline and standard sets what you can do, sets what you can pollute, sets how much can go out of your facility. And so if you create, as a person, if you are in a car and your speed limit is 100 miles per hour, it's a lot harder to be, you know, be in trouble with that speed limit or to unlawfully exceed that speed limit than it would if the speed limit was a safe and healthy 60 miles per hour. And then you take into consideration, right, that that road, that metaphoric road is going through the middle of a community, um, going through the middle of, you know, where somebody recreates, somebody fishes, somebody, somebody swims. So, you know, it's, it's a really big deal if we can get these things changed. Um, we feel really strongly that the case is going to be successful. Um, so the, I guess, three like top line points, and I'll do them quickly because I know we're, we're at a short for time, but the three top line points are if we're successful, besides the fact that the nasty pollution stream will have to be reduced from these operations, one way to consider it is that the current slaughter, the current 
stream of pollution that's allowed out of them allows for total nitrogen that is um, more than twice the concentration that is found in raw sewage for you know human households. Um, so that's pretty gross and that's disgusting and that has to change. Um, second, we know the technology is there. There are some plants that have voluntarily adopted them. Uh, the rest just need a little bit of motivation to get there as well. Um, and then third, which was mentioned earlier, is that we have a diverse set of co-plaintiffs, including community and um, environmental justice groups like the Rural Empowerment Association for Community Health, based out of North Carolina, and Comité Civico del Valle, who is based out of California. And you know, the reason that there this is so cross-sectional is because the cost is this industry's prioritization of profits over being good stewards of the environment results in harm to not just biodiversity and not just species, uh, not just natural resources, um, but also decreased quality of life for people who live near these polluting industries, higher healthcare costs, and just deep injustice for where they're cited, um, why they're allowed to remain the way that they are, and you know what that entails in terms of often structural racism. So you know it brings together those interests to try to make a better future for everyone. And then two of the other cases that kind of take us a little bit beyond that, the first of which would also be really relevant to what we're seeing right now, um, which is that the center along with its allies in the environmental or in the animal protection world um, have a case that's aimed at stopping additional regulatory changes by the Trump administration that if they go through will lead to increased pollution to waterways by way of changing the line speeds. Um, and so this rule, which was finalized late last year and that has been dubbed the hog line speed rule, did three things. It um, basically did away with line speeds. Again, with the, the speed limit analogy, right? But now it's your choice. You can do whatever you want. There's no speed limit anymore. So they did that for hog slaughter operations, uh, which means that the original limitation of 1,000 106, I believe, pigs per hour, out the door. Uh, the other two things they did, which are complementarily concerning, is that they reduced the number of federal inspectors on the line from seven to a maximum of three, and they replaced those roles with workers. Um, and what we've seen since COVID hit is that line speeds have continued to go up, that they've continued to get these waivers, um, and that these differing types of just additional responsibilities for workers are becoming harder and they were already extremely hard. These lines moved at breakneck speeds when there were still limits on them. And so for us, you know, in, in addition to, you know, seeking to make sure that workers and the environment or workers and animals and food safety doesn't suffer as a result of this, we also bring an environmental challenge to this. Uh, and what that looks like is because of the rule, and again, this rule specifically that we're challenging deals with hog slaughter operations, it's anticipated that about 11.5 million additional pigs will be slaughtered at these plants um, annually, which is a, a lot of pigs, right? And 11.5 million pigs equals the additional wastewater. That stream we were just discussing, more of it. Um, it equals additional freshwater demands. Uh, pig slaughter is estimated to require between 290 and 450 gallons of water per thousand pounds of slaughter live weight. Um, that's a lot of water use, um, especially if you multiply it by 11.5 million. Uh, additional air pollution, additional greenhouse gas pollution through transportation, um, and most importantly, an uptick in the number of animals that are going to be demanded from factory farms in the nearby area to fit that additional demand. I was just going to ask you about that because the issues you've been talking about are related to slaughter, which has its own suite of problems, but what about the factory farms and all of the news we've been hearing about factory farms and animal slaughter during COVID? Yeah, so um, there are complementary issues, as you said. Um, one of the reasons that we look at it in the vein of line speed in particular is it talks about the system as a whole. Right, that the factory farms are the feed that goes into the larger machine and the machine is the slaughterhouse and they come with their own suite of really problematic uh, environmental issues 
they bring, and people have probably heard a lot more about this. This, this is discussed a little bit more, more frequently. Um, and Stephanie was discussing it a little bit earlier. Things like greenhouse gas issues, uh, things like water quality issues, the same type of effluent flow when it comes to like antibiotics, when it comes to nitrogen, all of that comes from factory farms as well. They also have huge air pollution implications um, that include things like ammonia and hydrogen sulfide uh, and that are often dumped on communities and in particular rural communities. Um, and we work in a number of coalitions in those rural communities to uplift the voices of the people who are directly impacted by them. But it's, it, it's a really unjust industry. Um, yes, those two pieces fit together extremely well. And one of the really sad things that has been laid bare is that factory farm workers and slaughterhouse workers have to go to work, even though like the conditions are terrible. Do you want to just tell us about some of the human stories of the COVID impact, either Lorianne or you? I might, I might kick this to Lorianne. We were actually talking about this earlier and the story of uh, Tin Eye hit me really hard. So I can't do it without crying, but I'm mm -hmm. gonna kick it to Lorianne. So, um... When President Trump ordered these facilities to um, open despite hundreds of workers falling ill um, and many USDA inspectors and slaughterhouse workers um, dying, it was horrifying. Um, and a lot of the families of these people have come out and asked for their family stories to be known. And so I'm just going to briefly mention the most recent victim of this cruel policy. Um, she died in the JBS facility uh, in Greeley, Colorado, or as a result of exposure in that facility in Greeley, Colorado, um, that Hannah was talking about our litigation in. Her name was Tin A. She died at age 60. She spent a month on a ventilator. She... <laughs> was a Burmese refugee and she came here to have a better life with her family. Um, she spent her entire career in the U.S. at the JBS uh, facility where she was a very loyal employee. Um, when she started feeling sick, her daughter said she had COVID symptoms and asked her to go to the clinic um, at the slaughterhouse and she did. And they told her she had a cold and to go back. She valiantly fought for her life on a ventilator for a month. Um, and uh, after she spoke with her mother one last time, um, she passed. Um, and so I think it's really important that when we talk about these stories and the cruelty of this industry, um, we remember that these are real lives. Um, that we're talking about. These people are not expendable, um, but they are the collateral. Uh, cost of this system. So as an individual who wants to make a difference and who cares about freshwater mussels and fish and butterflies and worker safety and environmental justice issues, what if I switch to Beyond Burgers or Impossible Burgers? I heard that they're made with genetically engineered ingredients. Like, is that really going to make a difference? Stephanie, do you want to talk to us about how individual choices and in Impossible Burgers could help? Yeah, I can talk a bit about Impossible and Beyond Burgers and some of the benefits there. And then Lorian can talk a little bit more about the the, uh, the GE crop side of things. But I mean, one of the first things to realize is that I find it really heartening that so many people are thinking about switching their diets now, uh, that even though, you know, Trump has declared meat to be a matter of national security, that a lot of Americans don't agree. They're looking at these stories that are coming out of these slaughterhouses and out of these factory farms and and they're wanting to to step away from you know from supporting that industry and that's one of the things that's really powerful about individual choices is that you can choose whether this is an industry that you want to support or not um, and you know we'll talk a bit more on, on next week's webinar about food choices and how they you know play a big role in shifting the market and helping drive you know the important policies that we need to make better foods available but among that, one of those foods is these plant-based burgers, like the Beyond and Impossible burgers. And there are a lot of advantages to them. Um, you know, first of all, all of the things that Hannah was talking about, all of 
those issues, the pollution that comes from slaughterhouses, um, you know, the connection between factory farms and zoonotic diseases that we were talking about earlier, the widespread use of medically important antibiotics, all of these huge issues, they don't exist when the animals are taken out of the equation. So, you know, all of those pieces of, you know, of pollution and public health risk isn't a factor. So that's one huge advantage that these, that these plant-based burgers have. And on top of that, they use a fraction of the land and the water, the amount of pesticides on crops, and have a fraction of the greenhouse gas emissions footprint compared to beef burgers. So these benefits are so important because we're at such a crisis point, not just with what we're seeing at COVID-19, but with the extinction crisis and the climate crisis, that we need to change our food system. And these, this plant-based meat can really help people make that shift. People have never before thought about you know, replacing the meat in their diet are really enjoying these products that taste a lot like meat. And we found that to be so important that the center really went out on a limb and put out a statement in support of these products. And we really don't usually endorse specific products, but it's such a crisis point that the shift is so important. And I mean, of course, we recognize that these plant-based burgers, they're not a health food, but if you're going to grab a burger, I mean, you're better off grabbing one of these plant-based meat burgers. So Lorianne, if I grab a plant-based meat burger, am I killing monarch butterflies? So you're right, the GE products can have devastating effects on the environment. And since genetically engineered corn and soy came on the market, um, the, we've gone from using 10 million acres of Roundup or glyphosate in the United States to over 200 million pounds. And that, of course, has terrible impacts on the environment. Um, like killing the host plant for monarch butterflies. The next generation of G crops are even worse. They're to, uh, tolerant to glyphosate plus dicamba or glyphosate plus 2,4-D, which is famous for being an ingredient in Agent Orange. We're very concerned about the environmental impacts of these GE crops. Um, and in fact, we're deeply enmeshed in litigation on um, these two new uh, GE crop technologies. So what does this have to do with veggie burgers? Um, is that a lot of people have come out denouncing these veggie burgers saying um, it, the Impossible Burgers are made with GE soy. Um, and so uh, some people have come out opposing them. And we've even seen um, some progressive groups in parroting industry's talking points about them. Um, and that's been pretty surprising for us because of the benefits Stephanie outlined and also because of simple math. So as I mentioned earlier, um, animals aren't that efficient <laughs> at making food. So it takes between 48 to 58 pounds of feed in order to produce one pound of beef uh, that would go into a burger. But a plant-based burger like the Beyond Burger, I'm sorry, like the Impossible Burger, that uses no more than eight ounces of soy per pound. So we're comparing 48 to 58 pounds of GE corn or soy to eight ounces of GE soy. So there's a huge, huge difference in the amount <laughs> of the GE crop that you would be using if you made the transition and were eating Impossible Burgers instead. So, you know, it's ironic that by eating a GE <laughs> veggie burger, you would be displacing GE crops, but um, that's, that's the reality we're in. And it might not be a perfect solution, but we're in the midst of a sixth extinction crisis and we're in the midst of a climate crisis and we need solutions right now. We need solutions yesterday, but we need the solutions that are available to people this minute, people going through the drive-through. Um, one out of three uh, Americans eats fast food every single day and we need them to have foods available to them that are familiar, that are accessible. Um, and these plant-based burgers are a great option. It's also a false comparison to say that these plant-based um, burgers are ultra processed and that um, meat burgers are somehow very natural. So meat friendly industry written uh, regulations allow conventional beef to be labeled as 100% beef even though it was fed 40 to 58 pounds of um, uh, animal feed, usually GE. Um, it might contain hormones, um, antibiotics. Um, 
It uh, could have pharmaceuticals. It could have been exposed to feces, bacteria, and viruses, especially now with these increased line speed rules um, and reduced numbers of inspectors on the line. And then it does get intensively processed through slaughter and packing. So it's not correct to say these are ultra processed burgers. Um, these plant-based burgers are ultra processed and the meat burgers are not. Um, so that's, that's why we came out and like Stephanie said, took the extraordinary step of endorsing these products because they are a really important step at helping us shift away from animal meat. Okay, so Stephanie, everybody at home wants to help. How can our members help? Well, to start with, like we've been talking about now is, you know, the biggest things you can do is reduce your meat and dairy consumption. Um, and, you know, whether you want to try plant-based meat or, you know, switch to, you know, Whole Foods, try out a meatless Monday or, you know, switching out one particular product, like, you know, maybe the milk in your coffee, like wherever you need to start, start there and start now reducing your meat and dairy consumption. Um, and like I mentioned, we'll talk more next week about not just how you can do that, but also really why that's so powerful in helping us change the industry and change these industry-friendly policies. The other thing that you can do right now is, is to call your representative and tell them to make sure that not only to oppose Trump's policies that favor the industry, but to really put in place congressional oversight on these stimulus funds, because there's a huge amount of money that's going toward agriculture right now, and most of it is really at the USDA's discretion to hand out how they want. And as we know from the past, they're gonna hand that out to these industrial animal agriculture companies. Um, you know, we've seen in the past with bailout funds going to you know, these huge multinational companies running these factory farms and slaughterhouses. And we really wanna make sure that this stimulus funding is going to, to the workers, that it's going to support sustainable agriculture and the smaller farmers who really need it, and that it's not used as just another bailout for factory farms. Um, and then, you know, finally, you know, I'd also say is, you know, we talked a lot about the, the human aspect of this and really to support workers' rights and recognize how really inextricably linked our fights are, that, you know, we can't really fight for a sustainable, healthy food system if we are not fighting for something that is also sustainable, healthy, and fair for the people who are involved on the front lines of our food system as well. All right, well, thank you three experts for sharing that with us today. We've got a full 20 minutes for your questions and answers, and that is good because there's a zillion questions popping up already. <laughs> um, why are slaughterhouses exempt from USDA and Humane Society inspections? Is that you, Hannah? I am not sure the origin of the question. So they are not exempt from USDA inspections. They have to comply with the FMIA, the Federal Meat Inspection Act, and the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. Um, however, these line speeds go way beyond what those statutes allow. So we have challenges within our challenge to that rule specifically to them violating and ultra various going beyond those statutes and going beyond you know, the limitations where those statutes say that there needs to be humane treatment. Um, I think that perhaps the question may be why are CAFOs exempted? Because uh, farm animals largely are exempted from- Wait, what's a CAFO? I'm sorry. Um, factory farms, uh, concentrated animal feeding operations, those ones who produce all the animals in extremely confined, extremely terrible uh, environments. Um, they largely are exempted and there's been a lot of effort put in to change that to high, include welfare standards in there and it just hasn't been successful yet but there have been gains made um, so I, I my, I'm hopeful that the future will be better for those animals as well. I've got another slaughterhouse question for you. Why are slaughterhouses such large distributors of nitrogen and phosphorus? Is it that the nitrogen is used in the slaughterhouses? So it's largely created because of the biological process. Uh, animals in particular, their waste process creates nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, it also comes just from the standard production practices that come along with those kind of bodies. It's the same idea as why nitrogen and phosphorus is so uh, prolific in the production of these factory farms as well. And um, you know, it just put on an aggregate and larger scale within the slaughter facilities. 
And the reason that it ends up in the waterways is again because those pollution standards have not been corrected for a very long time. And one of the things that needs to be corrected is the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that goes out of, this, out of the operations into waterways underneath of legal requirements with the Clean Water Act. So someone asked, is there any good news? Um, are there any victories you can share with us? Or? Well, I can give a CAFO-related victory, a factory farm-related victory. Um, there was going to be the second largest dairy CAFO, uh, dairy mega dairy in Oregon. Um, that was we opposed with a large coalition in Oregon called the uh, Stand Up to Factory Farms Coalition. And they proposed it, the state got behind it, they permitted it, we fought them, uh, we highlighted them for the problems that they were. And within the first year, they violated the permit that was granted to them by the state about 120 times um, and ultimately were forced to shutter that operation. And that was because they were bad polluters and bad actors. And so bringing transparency to these processes, bringing transparency to what's going on with factory farms, I think is really, and with slaughterhouses is really a, a productive way forward. And a lot of our cases were to do that. And I think that Lorianne or Stephanie should talk about also like just the gains and opportunity um, and the gains in what's available to consumers because that is a huge change and such a benefit. Yeah, I think there are not only more products that are available, but the other thing that's really important to recognize about this is all of these, you know, for lack of a better word, all these shenanigans that we're seeing coming out of the Trump administration and the USDA and people who are close friends to, you know, to the animal agriculture industry, honestly, a lot of it is because they're scared. The public opinion is not in their favor. The market is not in their favor. Um, you know, we're seeing in a lot of different types of meat that, um, you know, that, that sales are dropping while we're seeing sales skyrocketing for plant-based meat alternatives. Polling is showing that more and more Americans want to eat plant-based foods. They want to reduce their meat consumption. And, you know, and we're working on a lot of different levels to make sure that the, that foods are available, that plant-based foods are, are more available and accessible and affordable to people. And as that's happening, like this is a sign that we're seeing the meat industry running scared. Um, so I think that that's something that's really, that's really good to hold on to in our work that often means that things get worse before they get better because they're going to fight harder, but so will we. So, I mean, I would take that away as some good news. And I would just, um, you know, I think you alluded to this, but it's easier than ever to not eat meat. Um, you know, anywhere you go, practically, there are options that um, don't have meat. And that wasn't the case um, 20 years ago, 23 years ago, when I became a vegetarian, it was much tougher. Um, and now it's mainstream. You can always find hummus and pretzels when you're running through the airport and need a snack. And that's that's reflective of all the efforts that all the people that are all all people are making in order to um, not support this terrible industry and shift towards a more sustainable way of eating. What about organic and grass-fed beef and dairy? So as I mentioned toward the beginning of this, um, you know, of the webinar that. There are, you know, definitely better and worse ways. You know, we talk about meat reduction. There will still be, you know, even when we think about our ideal farming system, there will, you know, still be some amount of, you know, meat and dairy production that's happening. And absolutely, we would want that to be organic. Um, we would want it to happen in ways that have minimal impact on wildlife and habitats. But the reality that we're facing right now is, I mean, first of all, it's the labeling seen as all over the place. It's really hard to know what you're getting when you see terms like sustainable, grass-fed, regenerative, like those terms are not regulated in any meaningful way. And a lot of them are really rapidly being co-opted because they know that people are looking for solutions like that. But the bigger issue is really the scale at the current amount of meat that we're eating. I mean, there's frankly, if everybody switched now just to grass-fed beef from conventional beef, there wouldn't be enough space in the country. I mean, there's simply not enough land to raise that many animals. And, you know, the grazing impacts that uh, on wildlife are, are so profound 
that if we were to rapidly and significantly scale up grass-fed beef production, it would be devastating to wildlife. So we're really cautious about, you know, how we, you know, recommending that as a solution because people really need to take reduction seriously. And, you know, if you've already really cut back on meat and dairy, if you're eating, you know, we say cut back about 90% on beef and 50% on all other animal products. And if that's where you're at and you're able to find these, you know, wildlife friendly, you know, more sustainable, minimal impact sources for the other meat and dairy, then, then that's great. But, you know, overall, we really want to focus on the need for, for these really dramatic reductions in meat and dairy consumption and production. A lot of people have asked about how many pounds of grain or soy it takes to produce a pound of beef. And I just did a quick Google search and it looks like there's estimates all over the place on that, probably depending on who you ask. Um, we'll put, do you guys have a, a, a recommended source on that? There's a source. We have a statement on our website um, about plant-based meat, and the source is cited in there for the statistic that Lorianne was talking about. So people can either check that out on the site or, you know, we can send that around with the follow-up. How do people get to that information on our website? Um, if you go under the Population and Sustainability Program and you go under our food section, you'll be able to find the statement there. Okay. And then there's a couple of questions about why aren't more organizations talking about this or why is there so little journalistic focus on it? Um, I can talk about that a bit. I think that we've seen a really big shift in recent years. I know when we launched our Take Extinction Off Your Plate campaign about six years ago now, we are the only environmental group talking about meat reduction and, and really trying to shine a light on these issues. But since then, you know, we've been working in these emerging coalitions of, you know, a lot of different environmental and public health groups that are working together on this issue. So there are a lot more organizations working on it. I'll say, that, you know, there are a couple of things that, that make it particularly tricky. And one is that it's, um, it's a controversial topic. It's really hard to talk to people about what they eat, because what we eat is so grounded in our identities, um, you know, in our, in our sense of culture and our sense of individuality. It's grounded in what's available to us in our communities. And there are just a lot of factors that go into it that, that make it really difficult. I mean, you know, in my job, I talk about population and contraception and how many people, you know, how many kids people want to have. And when I started talking about meat, there were a lot of people who were like, wait, let's go back to talking about family planning. That's easier to talk about. Than, than it is to talk about, about meat consumption and food. So I think that's one reason is that it's just really hard. There's a lot of pushback when we talk about these issues. So that's a lot for organizations to go up against. And then the other thing that we're up against is this really powerful industry. The US meat and dairy industries are among the most powerful lobbies in the world. Um, you know, I have colleagues in, in other countries working on meat and dairy and it's, it's an entirely different scene there. And the biggest threat to them oftentimes in their governments is when the US meat and dairy lobby goes overseas to try to interfere with their policies because they're worried it might set precedent that the US will look at someday. So, I mean, it's, you know, the, the power that we're up against as well as, you know, a lot of the built-in limitations to the laws that hold these industries accountable make it a really tricky issue, but it's a necessary one to work on and we're seeing more and more groups tackle that. What about legislation? Is there any legislation that would promote plant-based farming or move away from animal-based diets? Yeah, there are a number of things. There's actually a bill that's been introduced by um, Cory Booker and Elizabeth Warren was working with him on it. That's a moratorium on new factory farms, um, which would be an excellent step in the right direction. And there are also a lot of policies that can drive the way that, the, that we eat. Like for instance, right now, the, um, the US dietary guidelines are being revised. And although a lot of people don't think about the dietary guidelines, it used to be the food pyramid, now it's my plate, and like nobody thinks about that when they're eating, but those dietary guidelines actually have a huge influence on not just nutrition and the way that people think about food, but it has a huge purchasing power in food that goes into schools, hospitals, prisons, government cafeterias, it underpins a lot of the food policies that we see. And that, for instance, is one area where we can use a policy like that to promote sustainability, 
to promote meat and dairy reduction and an increase in plant-based foods. And that can wind up having a huge effect on the market. And there are a lot of different policies like that, some of which I'll talk about a little bit more in next week's webinar too, um, you know, from the local level on up that can really help make these foods more available and accessible, you know, which can ultimately help shift the, the farming system. That leads directly into this question. Are the alternatives really feasible in respect to the amount of water that's used, say for almond milk? Yes, um, almond, compared to other plant-based milks, um, almond is a thirstier crop but it actually uses far fewer resources than dairy milk. So it still winds up being a more sustainable choice. And many of the other um, plant-based milks, like oat milk, for example, that's really gaining in popularity, uses you know, far less water even than almond milk. And I may jump in really quickly with this one too, because the not only factory farming, but slaughter production uses extreme amounts of water. Um, first of all, bringing water to animals in confinement facilities is significant. That's especially true when it comes to cattle in feedlots. Um, they are thirsty animals, especially when they're in hot conditions. But slaughterhouses in particular are a whole new level of water use because they have to use those waters not only to keep the slaughterhouses clean, but they also use them for different methods. Like for example, with uh, poultry slaughterhouses, they use a stun bath often to stun the animal before they kill the animal. And those are just exorbitant amounts of water that go into it. Um, so you're, you don't only have just like the one crop issue, right, that feeds those animals, but also the animals themselves, and then the slaughtering process that, that is extremely thirsty. So the comparative aspect is particularly hard, um, but you know, just to amplify what Stephanie said, there is a lot of water that goes into the production of meat. So we have three questions about cultured meat, bioengineered meat, in vitro meat production. Is that a feasible solution to this? Well, I think, you know, when we look at cultured meat, it's similar to plant-based meat, where we're not necessarily looking at a, a singular solution. Like, not all of the protein that's eaten through animal products should be automatically switched just to these you know, just to these new alternative products. There are a lot of different ways that we can get our protein, but where these products really come into play is helping people transition away from these meat and dairy products. And in that sense, I think we see a lot of promise for the cultured meat, similar to what we see with the plant-based meat in terms of, you know, that from what we know right now, they use, you know, remarkably less resources, less water, land, emit fewer greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I think that there is some potential there. There are some big hurdles that it still needs to overcome. Um, while they have successfully made, you know, with some kinds of meat, they've successfully made cultured meat versions. Um, it still is going to take some time. They're still figuring out how that's going to be regulated. They, you know, I know that the folks working on this are really trying to pay attention to food safety and make sure that everything is, you know, is checked off there, that people feel really comfortable and confident in these foods. Um, the, the cost, it's going to take a little bit for that to come down. And then there's also this question of, of being able to scale up production since people, since Americans in particular eat so much meat, the question is, can it be scaled up to meet demand? And that's one of the areas that we're really looking at too is, you know, does that impact the, um, you know, the environmental cost of, of in vitro meat when it goes up to scale? And we, you know, from what we know, we assume that it's going to be, you know, still significantly smaller than the environmental cost that goes into creating meat from animals. Um, but there's still a little bit more information that, you know, that needs to come together on that. But I think that we will likely see it come to market within, you know, some people are saying within like the next five years, but I think probably within the next five to 10 years, we'll see it come to market. And it, and it could be, you know, another piece of the puzzle that helps us really transform our food system. Here's a question about medical doctors and health. Are there any doctors that would advocate a vegan diet or support this message? Yes, there are a lot of them. There are some who are very, very outspoken about this. Um, but, you know, we've also seen some doctors who are considered very, very mainstream. Um, you know, people who are high up in organizations, you know, like the American Heart Association, for example, who are, you know, who themselves have adopted plant-based diets and are advocating for them. And we also saw, interestingly, last year a policy was adopted by the American Medical Association that acknowledged one thing that they looked at was specifically how with dairy, 
um, there's high levels of lactose intolerance in Asian and African American populations. And as a matter of, you know, of really of, of equality and making sure that everybody has foods that can meet their nutritional needs and aren't being pressured into eating things that their bodies frankly can't even process, um, you know, they passed a policy that really asked for the US dietary guidelines and other food and diet related policies to make meat and dairy optional instead of required. This question can apply to all of the work that we do. How do you combat the politicians who are paying off industry to pollute and get rid of environmental regulations? Lorian, you want to take that one? <laughs> we just fight. We wake up early in the morning and fight. <laughs> we fight late at night. We fight on the weekends. We just keep at it. And you know, our, our battles are, are one with tenacity. Um, and we celebrate the wins that we get. Um, we encourage people to vote um, and we keep going. And one of the things too that's really about, one thing that's really great about the food issue is that it is so sensitive to the market. Like this is an area where we as individuals really have a lot of power in our daily choices. You know, there are some of the other issues that we work on, like energy, where it's much harder for us to choose where our energy comes from, just because it's, it's built into our local utilities and what's available. But we get to choose every day what it is that we eat. Um, and, you know, as Lorianne was saying, there's so many more options that are available now to choose plant-based foods and to reduce our meat and dairy consumption. And as we choose this, and this has really been one of the most powerful things in the food movement, is that there's only so long that they can fight against market forces. You know, and as the market is showing that nobody wants meat and dairy at the same levels that they used to, but what people do want is more plant-based foods and, you know, and healthier foods for them that, you know, that it starts to get, it starts to shift the, the balance of power a bit. So if there are meat eaters on this webinar who want to switch to a high protein diet, what should they eat? Um, there are a lot of different options out there. Um, you know, beans, nuts, uh, legumes, lentils, things like that. Like those all have a lot of protein in them. A lot of grains have protein in them, um, you know, such as quinoa is very high protein. And a lot of vegetables have protein in them as well. So, you know, what a lot of people don't realize is just if you eat a, a well-balanced diet of, of healthy whole foods, of fresh vegetables, of, you know, whole grains, and of, you know, these beans and, and, and legumes that you can more than meet your protein needs. And I'd also recommend if people are looking particularly for, have questions about this, there's a documentary that recently came out called Game Changers. And Game Changers particularly looks at athletes who were eating very high protein diets of very high protein needs, like much higher than average. And it really looks at their journey in shifting towards plant-based food and how they've been able to meet their needs and consider perform, continue performing at these really remarkable high levels. And one person that I, I would say from just like people in my life who have found very informative is somebody called Dr. Michael Greger. He's published a lot of books on these issues and he combines both the questions about physicians who are concerned and how to make a safe transition into a healthy diet. Um, so he has lots of materials out there. He has a website. Um, this is not an endorsement for him and he does not work for us. I just think that he genuinely is a good resource. I think, you know, this is a good time for us as a country to sort of do a hard reckoning with where we are with our health um, and what the cost we're willing to impose on um, workers is. And I think, you know, people are people are staying home more, eating at home more, experimenting in the kitchen more now. And it's a, it's a good time to start thinking about making healthy transitions. Thank you, Stephanie, Lorian, and Hannah. And thank you to everyone at home for joining us today. We're out of time. Next week's webinar is about eating to save the planet. So you'll get a registration email on Sunday if you want to join us then. We're even going to have a little cooking demonstration. Um, Stephanie and I are going to be on Slack tomorrow in the Endangered Species channel from 12 to 1 Pacific to answer more of your questions. And just look for the email tomorrow and thank you for your time. Take care. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.